Right, hi everyone, we'll be starting in one minute's time. Thank you. 
All right, sorry for that delay. Good afternoon, everyone, and hope you guys had a good weekend and so forth. Today's lecture is going to be on the topic of board plot, which typically contributes towards a 10 mark question out of the 100 marks in your final exam. And but this week in particular, we'll only be focusing on board plots as of such, because there are three lectures associated with this topic. The first lecture that we're doing today is actually quite important because as you will see throughout this lecture, there are a few examples that form the basis of how we actually do board plots for complex systems. So it's quite important that uh, you take note of these examples when we actually do reach them and how each of the magnitude and phase plots that form the board plots, uh, why are they important for each one of these examples? Because later on, and in particular in tomorrow's lecture, when we start doing complex systems, those examples form the basis for how you actually go about formulating your magnitude and board plots, uh, your magnitude and phase plots in particular, for actually obtaining your overall board plot for your entire system. And the nice thing about this is that the board plots that we'll be using here, are the equations for them will be formulated in the Laplace domain first, and then at the intermediate stage, we'll be transferring them into the Fourier domain or the J omega domain as of so. But as you guys see the examples in this particular lecture and then in tomorrow's lecture when we do a complex system example, uh, it will become a little more clear as to how we actually use all of these together to get our overall board plot in its entirety. So let's consider the Laplace transfer function here, uh, which is basically going to be what we refer to as a second order transfer function. Uh, reason for this being second order is because we watch the degree of the denominator here and the highest power here is going to be to the power of 2, the s. And the questions that arrive from having a Laplace transfer function or a system transfer function in this particular case is, okay, how do we de determine uh, the system characteristics? And such characteristics could be either the magnitude versus the frequency, which is going by the modulus of g, j omega here, and the phase versus frequency, which is going to be very similar to the argument of g, j, j omega as of such. And note that in doing the magnitude and phase plots here, because they're going to be versus frequency, uh, that instead of this being respect to s, it's going to respect to j omega. And in order to get this equation to transfer from s to j omega, we just substitute s equals to j omega accordingly to get the relevant equation. But it's not such that it's a straight substitution. There are a few steps that need to be done before you actually move into the substitution. And we'll observe this as we go along in the lecture. So the first step that we will do is that we'll factorize the numerator and denominator accordingly into its relevant factors if it's possible. And then after we factorize it, then we substitute s equals to j omega into the equation for g of s. So that means g of s transforms into g j omega as of such. And because we have this omega here, that means that the entire equation now is respect to omega, and omega is basically a function of frequency. The next step after we do this is that we need to transform this g g omega here in this factorized form to something we refer to as our standardized form. And in particular, if we wanted to do this manually for our magnitude and phase plots, we would have substituted values of omega and then plot the magnitude and phase uh, accordingly. And this is actually a lot complex to do by hand. Uh, computationally, it's a little bit easier to do but it doesn't really make much sense. Uh, what we'll be using is what we refer to as asymptotic board plots, uh, which were developed by Henry Bode, a uh, telecoms engineer at Bell Labs. And basically we'll be obtaining two plots in particular, the gain or Manchi plot, which is going to be modulus of g, g omega versus frequency, and the phase plot or the angle plot, which is referred to as the argument of g, g omega versus frequency as well. So the next few examples that we're going to be observing are we want to consider these as our rules for drawing the, asymptot the asymptotic board plots in particular. And these rules actually are quite important for where we're going to be doing complex systems later on. So just to give you an idea of what the plot axes look like, 
Note that for the Maiju plot here, this Y axis is going to be in decibels. So that means you're going to have to take 20 log of the raw value here to get this into the decibel form. And then the decibel form here, even though it's on the Y axis, it's still linearly spaced. So it'll be like 0, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 and so forth going on. The X axis here, on the other hand, is logarithmically spaced. And this is respect to frequency. So we see here that from here it's 10 to the power 0 and then 10 to the power 1, meaning that each one of these spaces in here is going to be uh, like this is going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and all such. But then we see the spacing in between here from 10 to the 1 and 10 to the 2 means that each one of these spaces is going to be spaced by 10 accordingly. So this will be like 10, this will be like 20, 30, 40, 50, and so forth. And then like for 10 to the 2 here and 10 to the 3, the spacings here are going to be by 100. So just pay attention to this x-axis here because it's going to be logarithmically spaced, not linearly spaced. Similarly for our, our phase plot or argument plot, uh, we see here that our angle, well we have negative angles here and positive angles. Uh, if you're more comfortable dealing with only positive angles, that's perfectly fine. You can go from 0 to 360 degrees. Uh, if you're okay with this plot, you see here this goes from 0 to positive 180 degrees and then 0 to negative 180 degrees. It basically maps the 360 degrees of a circle, just that from 0 to 180 it will be positive and then like from 0 to negative 180 this is like if you're going from 360 degrees backwards to 180 degrees. So either way of representing the y-axis here is perfectly fine, whichever one you're more comfortable with if you just want to use 0 to 360 degrees. If you're okay with 0 to 180 and 0 to negative 180, that's perfectly fine. Uh, the x-axis here also follows the same logarithmically spaced uh, axis that we just saw for the Maju plot. So the spacing in between 10 to the 0 and 10 to the 1 will be 1. The spacing in between 10 to the 1 and 10 to the 2 here will be 10. And similarly, the spacing between 10 to the 2 and 10 to the 3 here will be 100 as of such and so forth. Alright, so let's get on to our examples here, which basically form our rules for when we're doing asymptotic mode plots. And these rules will be very helpful for us doing our complex mode plots later on. So our first example here is, let's say if we had our H of S system here just equal to some constant value with no S component. And um, we're going to ask what's going to be magnitude versus frequency. So if we take the modulus of this, uh, it comes like we just take the modulus of K, which is just going to be a constant. And um, because this is like if we're taking the raw value here, modulus of k will just give us k accordingly. And eventually we'll have to map this into decibels. So we just take 20 log of k, where the log is going to be log to the base 10. The phase versus frequency here is such that if k is positive, the angle here will be 0 degrees. But if k is negative, when we do our phase, it's going to be minus 180 degrees. So this is the only point of importance that you have to pay attention to in particular. That the sine of k here will determine the angle that which k takes. So if it's positive, it's 0 degrees. But if it's negative, it's going to be minus 180 degrees. Now, because our y-axis for magnitude plot was expressed in decibels, that means you're going to have to transport that at transform that absolute value into decibels using the following equation here. There's going to be 20 log to the base 10 of hg omega. Um, we knew us now saw that hg omega is basically k, so it'll just become 20 log 10 of k as of so. And we also saw earlier on that the frequency range being on our x-axis is going to be using a logarithmic base 10 scale. And this is actually quite useful for keeping the axis on the plot with the same scale. Uh, no, in this particular case, k is not a complex number, k is a real number, because it's a, it is a constant. Uh, the only time when we'll be dealing with complex numbers is when we actually have that s component, because remember, s is equal to common delta plus g omega as of such. But for now, because it's a constant k, this is a real number only. It is not a complex number. So in doing the magnitude plot here for h of s equal to k, it's just going to be a constant value here as of such once we take 20 log of k because the y-axis is, is, is expressed in decibels. So this will hold true for all frequencies uh, of omega in particular, or magnitude plots.
our phase plot, if k is positive, it's going to be a constant 0 degrees for all frequencies of omega. And if k is negative, it's going to be at minus 180 degrees for all frequencies of omega as of such. And that basically is the end of our first example where we just have a constant real number in particular. So our second example here is when we have a pole at the origin. Uh, as of such, that means we're going to have k here being our real number divided by s. And the question is, okay, well, how do we obtain our magnitude and phase versus frequency graphs? So uh, if we express this accordingly, uh, we see s here, when we transform s into j omega, we get k divided by j omega here. And if we rationalize this, meaning that we multiply by j and uh, j on the, the underside, it comes like we just get k here divided by omega, and then if we take the angle of that, that's going to be minus 90 degrees in particular, because we had that j component on the numerator. So when we do the magnitude in particular here, it comes like because we have k divided by omega and the angle here is minus 90 degrees, if we watch this in the k divided by j omega form, this comes like we take 20 log of k here on the numerator, and then whatever's on the denominator, that means it's going to be minus. So this is going to be minus 20 log of the omega factor here as of so. And this is actually going to give us a little interesting property here, because we have our 20 log of k here, which is a constant value. But now we have this 20 log of omega here, and we know omega here is going to be changing on our x-axis. So how does this actually affect how our magnitude plot is going to look? And as of such, when we watch this, it comes like, okay, we have 20 log of k here represented by this point here, uh, because our frequency here, omega, is going to be 1. Uh, we know log of 1 is basically going to be 0. And then we have 20 log of k divided by omega for any value of omega here as of such, as we keep on going. So we see that we have a fairly linear plot here, but uh, in this particular case, we need to figure out, okay, it's linear, but what's the gradient of this line? And this slope, when we calculate fit, uh, we t let's say we just take two points in particular, when omega is equal to 1 and omega equals to 10, and we obtain the y-axis values here. So when omega is equal to 1, the y-axis is going to be 20 log of k. And when omega is equal to 10, that y-axis there is going to be 20 log k minus 20. And we just basically apply this sort of general gradient equation for a straight line. So as of such, uh, we have the difference in y values here. So we have this value here, 20 log k minus 20. And then we minus 20 log of k, so we get negative minus 20. And this is in decibels here because of the 20 log uh, calculation that we just loaded. And because it's going to be divided by our x-axis values, which is going to be basically 10 and 1 here as of such, this change in x-axis here is basically a tenfold, which is a decade. So as of such, we just shortcut this and we say that the gradient for this particular example is going to be minus 20 decibels per decade. So our magnitude plot here, for example, 2, which is a pole at the origin, is basically just going to be a straight linear plot here for a line with a gradient of minus 20 decibels per decade. Our phase plot, because we just only had omega on the denominator, as of such, and when we did that rationalization, we saw that it was minus 90 degrees. So our phase plot here just transfers so that it's a constant minus 90 degrees for all values of omega here in particular. Our third example here is when we have a zero at the origin. So instead of being k divided by s, we have k multiplied by s. And what we're going to observe here for example 3 is just going to be the opposite of what we observed for example 2. So, I'm just going to show you guys the work in, but you're going to basically see the example in particular, because now the s is on the numerator instead of the denominator. This comes like when we transfer this into the j omega domain, we get k multiplied by j omega, and that j there basically gives us our angle out of such. So it comes like we have k omega, and the angle here is positive 90 degrees. And if we do our decibel rationalization here in particular, uh, it comes like we get 20 log of k plus 20 log of omega. And what this means is that, for this being the opposite of when we had the pole at the origin case, which was example two, 
Uh, we saw that in that particular case it was minus 20 decibels balance per decade, but in this particular case, because our S, the S component is on the numerator and this being a zero, that means we have a linear slope here of positive 20 decibels per decade. So the all at the origin and the zero at the origin are basically opposites of each other when it comes to uh, remembering them in particular. So the zero at the origin case, instead of it being minus 20 decibels per decade, it's positive 20 decibels per decade as of such. And our phase plot, instead of it being minus 90 degrees, which was for the pole at the origin, it's now positive 90 degrees for our zero at the origin. So it's basically just the opposite of what you saw for example two in particular. Example four here is basically what happens that let's say we have a power of s here on the denominator instead. So this is referred to as poles of order more than one at the origin. So when we transfer this in particular into our magnitude and phase plots, we see that basically it comes like we have a multiple of n here representing our angle and our phase in particular. Uh, sorry, our angle and our magnitude in particular. Now, we want to observe what happens as if we increase this value of n here. So that means like if we go s squared, s cubed, s to the power of 4 and so forth, we want to see what happens to the behavior of magnitude and phase plots. So in particular, because this being a pole of order more than one at the origin, meaning that it's on the denominator, as the order increases, meaning that uh, if we have n equal 1, n equal 2, and n equal 3, the slope here is going to be minus 20 multiplied by n decibels per decade. So as we saw in our case, when it was just k divided by s, the order there was 1. So this is just going to be minus 20 by 1 here, giving us minus 20 decibels per decade. But if we go s squared and s cubed this is going to be minus 40 and minus 60 accordingly because it becomes minus 20 by 2 giving us all minus 40 for n equals 2 and it's going to be minus 20 by 3 here when n is equal to 3 giving us minus 60 as of such so once we have powers of s on the denominator it's just going to be minus 20 n decibels per decade for magnitude slope here as of such it's still a linear behavior regardless our phase plot is also going to be minus n multiplied by 90 degrees. So uh, in our particular case, when it was just k divided by s, it was at minus 90 degrees. But let's say if it's k divided by s squared, it's going to be minus 180 degrees. And if it's k divided by s cubed, it's going to be minus 270 degrees. We just substitute the values of n here accordingly into the equation to get our phase as of such. And as seen before, it's basically a constant value for all values of omega in particular. Example 5 here being our zeros at the origin is basically the opposite of example 4. So that means instead of everything being negative, it's now just going to be positive because of that S component here being on the numerator instead. So as of such, for magnitude plots, that means it's going to be positive 20 n decibels per decade, fit the order being here n. So like I said, if it was for uh, AS cube. That means n is equal to 3, so that of such as 20 by 3, giving us a slope of 60 decibels per decade as of such. And the same thing if we had for s, uh, sorry, n equal 2 and n equal 1, we just apply the equation accordingly to get our linear behavior here for our magnitude graph as of such. The phase graph, like I said, is just basically the opposite of the poles of order more than 1 at the origin. It's going to be a negative n minus 90 degrees, it's just going to be positive n 90 degrees where we substitute n here as the order for our system as of such. Alright, so those basically were like the simple examples. This is where we have to pay attention in particular for where we have a little bit of complexity with our transfer functions in particular. So at this point, we're going to observe that what happens when we have a single pole transfer function, meaning that we have some sort of root on the denominator instead. So when we have this in particular, uh, we notice that the numerator here is the same value of our root value here as of such. That means our first step here when we're doing this is that we transfer it into our geodomega domain. And then we move from this form here, which is basically our regular form, into our standardized form. And in doing this, this comes like 
we say okay we divide our numerator and denominator here by p so to give you an idea of what this looks like when we go into standard form One second, guys, I forgot to one thing here to get my stylus to work. Okay, so in transforming this into standard form, it comes like such that we divide the numerator and denominator here by p. So it comes like it's p divided by p j omega divided by p plus p divided by p and that there will transfer to 1 that there will just transfer to 1 and we get j omega divided by p here which basically transfers to that point there in particular so that's a way to transform your j omega general equation into standard form uh, a nice simpler way to do this is that we can do this in the s domain instead so let me just erase all of this here in particular. So I'll show you guys how to do it in the S domain before we move into the J omega domain. So we can use this equation here, and then we can just say divide the numerator and denominator by p. We get p divided by p here, and s divided by p plus p divided by p. And this basically will go to 1 divided by. 1 plus s divided by p and then if we transfer this into the j omega domain just 1 divided by 1 plus j omega divided by p which basically gives us the same equation that we just all had here so either way of doing the standardized form is perfectly fine whichever way you're more comfortable with you'll get the same answer in the end once we have the equation in standard form as we just not saw here we need to pay attention to the, uh, the effect of h g omega here with respect to extreme values of omega so let's pay attention to this omega divided by p property here which is going to basically uh determine the behavior of our magnitude plot because we're dealing with our magnitude plot first in particular so if omega divided by p is way greater than 1 meaning that uh, omega here is going to be way less than the value of p so this is going to be a very small value that means we're going to move towards the magnitude of h j omega here going to be 20 log of 1 because this j omega divided by p here is just going to be approaching a value of 0 and we just get 1 divided by 1 so 20 log of 1 and log of 1 is basically just going to be a value of 0 so this is when Omega divided by p here approaches a very small value. Particular. Then we're going to observe what happens uh, when this omega divided by p value here is going to be much greater than 1, meaning that we're going to some very large value. Uh, meaning that the value of the numerator here being omega is much greater than the value of the pole value here, p and p. So what happens here is that we get when we so our magnitude function we have 20 log of 1 being that 1 in the numerator but now we have minus 20 log of omega divided by p as of such and we know that log of 1 here was 0 so that resolves such that we get it's going to be minus 20 log of divided by so minus 20 log of omega divided by p and because omega here is much greater than p we just basically ignore this value of p here as of such because it's going to approximate to minus 20 log of omega as omega tends towards infinity and as of such what we saw from our previous uh, examples uh, basically once we have this kind of behavior where this is basically omega assuming any value here but in this particular case it's going to be omega approaching a very large value this slope basically approximates the minus 20 decibels per decade, which we just now saw for an example two when we had a pole at the origin. So basically this entire approximation as omega approaches a very huge value means that our slope here now becomes minus 20 decibels per decade. So if we plot these in particular, we saw that for a very small value of omega being much less than our pole value, 
it's basically going to be at our zero decimal line. And then for any large value of omega, being that it's much greater than our core value here, it's going to be at a minus 20 decibel per decade slope in particular. And this break point here, uh, sorry, this intersection point or break point, what we refer to, is what we call our corner frequency or break frequency or cutoff frequency. And this here is basically, if we watch this on the omega axis, this point here is basically at P. And we're going to observe the working for this on the next slide in particular. As to what actually occurs at this point, which we refer to as our cutoff frequency. So when omega here is equal to P, and if we actually apply our equation as of such for our magnitude, when we do all the fancy mathematics and so forth, and then so forth, whatever and so forth, this basically is going to be 20 log of 1 divided by root of 1 plus omega divided by P squared, and omega here is equal to P, so this is just going to be 1 squared. So we get 20 log of 1 divided by root 2, and when you do the mathematics behind that, this resolves to an approximate value of minus 3 decibels. So this is actually referred to as our cutoff frequency, and this is where we actually get this minus 3 decibels for uh, any filter design in particular, uh, especially for or like your low-pass filters and high-pass filters. This is where the mathematics of it comes into play, as to why we refer to this as a minus 3 decibel drop, uh, or cutoff frequency in particular. So the true plot, if we didn't do a straight line approximation, means that we have this sort of curve here in particular, representing this drop from zero decibels to minus three decibels at this value of P here in particular. But because we're doing straight line approximations, we basically just go ahead with saying, okay, up to from anything before P, being omega equals P here at this point, anything before that, it's just going to be zero decibels per decade. And everything after P, it's going to be minus 20 decibels per decade as of such. So this is going to be our straight line approximation here represented by this orange line for our magnitude plot regarding a single pole transfer function. For the phase versus frequency, we're going to actually observe this uh, mathematically in order to determine how we actually do, do we obtain our plot. So when omega divided by p here is going to be a very small value, meaning that omega is much less than p, this comes like we get the minus tan inverse of zero, which is going to give us zero degrees when we apply it to our hg omega equation. Yeah. But omega much greater than p, that means that the denominator here is going to be uh, a very big value. And as of such, that means that it comes like we just have minus tan inverse of infinity in particular. So uh, because of this, this comes like, uh, because we approach infinity as of such, this means that our tan graph, we're basically get this to be minus 90 degrees. And uh, when we have omega equal to p here in particular, when we apply our angle equation as of such, this comes like we get minus 10 inverse of 1. And this just resolves to minus 45 degrees. So the true plot basically would be this dotted red line here representing this change of 45 degrees as of such. But because we deal with straight line approximations, we say for anything of omega much less than p, meaning anything before this p value here, it's just going to be a constant zero degrees. For omega equal to p, we just have a sharp vertical transition to our new value. And then for anything being omega greater than p, we just say it's going to be at a constant value of minus 90 degrees. So we have this vertical transition here representing this curve that would be the true plot. But because we're dealing with straight line approximations, we just do this fake case here as of such. Right. The next example here is when we have a single zero transfer function. And basically, we just also from our previous examples that 
The pole version is basically the opposite of the zero version. And we're going to see that it's the same thing regardless for this particular example. It's just basically going to be the opposite of the previous example, which was a single pole transfer function. So we basically do the same steps as before. Uh, we convert it into the J domain domain and then we standardize it. You can do the same thing as before. You can standardize it in the S domain first and then just change it into the J omega domain. Either way, fine. After we standardize it, we then observe the effect of H J omega extreme values of omega. So we see that similarly from before, uh, when omega divided by P is much less than one, meaning that this is going to be a very small value. Uh, when we do the magnitude equation, it's just going to be 20 log of 1 being 0, so that's going to be 0 decibels per decade. When omega divided by p is much greater than 1, being that it approaches a very huge value, we see that's going to be 20 log 1, but instead of this being minus here, it's going to be plus because the 0 is on the numerator instead. So, as of such, 20 log 1 here will just resolve to 0, and we review with 20 log omega divided by p. And omega here is basically approaching infinity, and we saw that for our example 3, which was our pole at the, oh sorry, our zero at the origin, uh, this comes like such that it will be approximating to 20 decibels per decade in particular. So what our magnitude graph looks like is that instead of it going minus 20 decibels per decade uh, at omega equals p, anything greater than that, it's not going to be positive 20 decibels per decade. So it's just basically going to be the opposite of our single pole transfer function that we just saw. So, so anything for omega less than p is just going to be zero decibels per decade. And then for omega greater than p, it's going to be positive 20 decibels per decade as of some. But the phase versus frequency, it means that all these angles that we just sort of observed for the single pole transfer function is not going to be positive. So for when Omega divided by p is a very small value. That means instead of it being minus tan inverse, because everything is on the numerator, this is going to be positive tan inverse. So this is going to be zero degrees. Uh, uh, omega divided by p being a very large value, this is going to be tan inverse of infinity. So that's going to be minus. Uh, this is going to be 90 degrees, positive 90 degrees. And then when it's omega equal p, that's going just going to be tan inverse of one. So that's going to be equal to 45 degrees in particular. So instead of it being stepped down as we saw in a single pole transfer function, this is going to be stepped up for a single zero transfer function. So uh, anything less than p here, uh, being omega less than p, it's going to be zero degrees. At omega equals p, it's going to be a sharp vertical transition here, so our new value. And then for omega much greater than p, meaning that anything after p here is going to be at positive 90 degrees as of such. All right, so that basically brings us to the end of our first board plot lecture. And we basically saw that you don't need to basically memorize all several examples. Once you know, like if you memorize all the pole examples, it's basically the zero examples are just going to be the physical opposite of what you memorize for the pole. So if it goes minus 20 decibels per decade for our pole functions, when it goes to the zero functions, it's just going to be positive 20 decibels per decade. Similarly, for the phase, if it was minus 90 degrees, for the zero functions, it's just going to be positive 90 degrees as of such. Uh, anything that was at zero, it's, there's no opposite for zero, it's just going to be at zero in particular. And we basically saw that uh, for example six and seven, the only thing that we basically need to pay attention to is the standardization, which is going to be quite important when we move on into complex systems in our next lecture tomorrow. So that standardization actually is quite important for moving on with respect to complex systems. So it's sort of, just make sure you, you memorize this because that actually comes towards marks and it's actually quite important for the process of when you're actually doing this in particular. Uh, the only other unique case that you have to memorize as well would be when we had the constant value, which was example one. But basically the magnitude plot is just gonna be 20 log of k, where k is our real number. And then the only particular property you have to pay attention to is the phase plot, is once k is positive, it's at constant zero degrees. If k is negative, it's going to be at minus one degrees. So that's the only other one you'd like, you'll have to memorize in particular as of. Right. Uh, so at this point, are there any questions regarding the, the contents of this lecture?
So the purpose of the standardization, and you'll see it in tomorrow's lecture in particular, the reason why you do this is because when you're starting with complex systems, it becomes harder to track where the poles are and the zeros are in particular. So we standardize to make this a lot easier when we start dealing with complex systems. And the standardization actually is quite important, especially when, let's say, if you have to programmatically do a mode plot, because uh, that makes the computations a lot simpler and a lot more efficient especially for the magnitude and phase plots when you start doing the mathematics behind it and if you had to program this mathematics. So that's why we do standardization in particular. It just makes things a lot more optimized, especially if you have to program it in particular. It also helps because uh, it also gives you a reference starting point for the magnitude and phase plots as of such, because if you don't have that reference starting point, uh, your board plots tend to get quite messy so the reason for the standardization is to get a good reference starting point in particular. Because as you notice, uh, for example, six and seven, our starting points were basically not like zero decibels per decade uh, at the zero degree line as of such. So that gives us a very base starting point to, to work with. If there are any other questions, feel free to ask them now. All right, doesn't seem like we have any further questions. So um, before I go, I have started marking your midterm so far. So you may expect to get the results. Uh, I want to say hopefully before the end of next week. Oh, okay, we have one more question. How did we get the square root in the decibel calculation, for example? All right, let me backtrack a little bit. This. I mean this square root. Uh, this is basically like when you do a general uh, magnitude equation. Because remember when you do the magnitude equation in particular for complex numbers, uh, it comes like, okay, uh, in doing the magnitude equation, when you take the magnitude of something on the numerator here, okay, that's fine. But when you have a complex number here, it comes like you have to square each one of these terms in particular, and then you have to take the square root of that. So it comes like you're trying to get the overall average of the denominator when you're doing this for the magnitude. So this here is basically 1 squared plus omega divided by p squared when you're actually doing this equation. And that's basically the general gist of when you're doing anything for magnitude when you're dealing with uh, complex numbers in particular. That's why you get that square root. So yeah, um, right. So hopefully by the end of next week, you guys should get back your marks. Uh, so far, I have finished correcting question one for everyone's paper, and the marks are looking pretty okay so far. 
So hopefully that trend continues for when I start correcting questions two and three. And uh, hopefully everyone gets a good mark on the midterm. Yeah, that is for all magnitude calculations. Once you have any sort of complex uh, situation, either on the numerator or denominator, you square each one of the terms in particular, and then you take the overall square root of all those terms. So like if it was like one plus s plus s squared, you will do one squared plus s squared plus s squared squared, and then you take the square root of that. But that's basically the general just for any magnitude calculation that you will encounter. All right, so if there are any further questions, uh, feel free to drop it down in the comments below, or you can email me those questions in particular. And tomorrow's lectures, which actually are going to be quite important, uh, will start focusing on how do we actually apply all of these examples we just saw here. So all of these seven examples with respect to how we actually start applying it to complex systems. And it's, that is sort of important, especially for like the types of questions that you will encounter in your final exam. So try your best not to miss tomorrow's lecture. Right. Uh, I can also tell you guys up front that because of time constraints, uh, we will not be scheduling any more problem sets. Uh, there was supposed to be one more problem set with respect to the Fourier transform and the Fourier series. If we do have time after we complete all the lectures, we will get to that problem set. And then if we have any free time in between, we can also schedule optional sessions for like practice questions that you may encounter in your final exams. Uh, but we will see how that works with respect to our timing and so forth. Because I know you guys will have a lot of stuff due coming out at the end of the semester. And if, like, if there are any free time in between exams and so forth, depending on the schedule, we'll work something out. If not, um, eventually I would end up posting all the past papers and the past paper solutions for whatever I have available on me. So uh, I'll figure out something out as of such. It also helps like if you guys are attempting certain questions and you start getting problems, you're free to email me those problems in particular, show me you're working and I can give you feedback accordingly. So that way you guys can see how to go about doing the question correctly. Alright, so Try your best not to miss tomorrow's lecture, and until tomorrow, take care, be safe, and I will see you guys soon. Later.